welcome back to the Lekker Queen podcast. I have a very, very special guest here with me today. I'm so honored that he could be here. I'm just geeking out. I am fan geeking out. I am so, ugh. I will let Daryl introduce himself. Daryl, tell us all about yourself. Sure. Hi, Nora. And it's a pleasure to speak to you. And I'm so glad you asked me to be on this podcast. Yeah. So my name is Daryl Chang. I'm a creator of Houseplant Journal and author of The New Plant Parent. Yes, yes, yes. Now, I've been following you for quite some time, Daryl, a very long mm-hmm. time. And <laughs> Thank you. Y- y- you are the person who introduced me to the uh, time lapse videos. Mm, yes, yes. Yes. Your time lapse videos are what caught my attention. And I was just like, oh my God. And you are the author. And I've seen lots of people do it, but I think you are the OG. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the uh, good, good plant, good growing yes. plant. Yes, I love it. I absolutely love it. So, like I said, I've been following you for quite some time, and this is really just a dream come true for me. Well, first of all, a little bit about me. I love giving people information and I love giving people accurate information. I do not like anecdotal information. And so one of the things I'm really, really big about is getting people to establish their credibility. You know, why should why should people listen to you? Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, OK, so I I wasn't like trained in in plants or anything like that i my background is engineering so Mm -hmm. i studied uh like computer engineering and like software design and that kind of thing and so one of the key things about it was like how do we make a system that people are able to use and use well and correctly and all that right Mm. Um, and so and also training material like how do you train basically is what a lot of my engineering background is so when i started the way i started with house plants was my mom at the time when i was living at home she said hey daryl help me decorate my house with some with some house plants but mm-hmm. i said okay but she also added but you need to figure out how to take care of them because i i'm quote unquote bad with plants or i kill everything yeah and but this to me was like a total contradiction because she grew a really nice garden she grew vegetables she showed me how to like she t- basically taught me gardening, yeah. outdoor gardening. But then indoors, she seemed just clueless. Clueless. And I, and I said, okay, well, I'll just buy a bunch of plants and I'll do like every millennial and just Google, like, <laughs> yeah. how do you take care of them, right? Yeah. And this is where, when I read the usual stuff that people say about houseplant care, bright and direct light, water once a week, you know, if you're yeah. yellowing leaves over watering, blah, 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 then I realized that oh, this is like so generic and is so lacking in any concrete data that anybody yeah. who has a, a slightly more like engineering or scientific mindset would just be like, w- where are the precise instructions? Instructions, here, right? exactly, right. So, so exactly it. Exactly. So it was, it was more of a thing like, okay, well then I'm just going to start a journal. That is literally why it's called Houseplant Journal because it is just... Yeah me writing about and documenting okay how are my plants doing and like so i came to learn that my plants did very well at that old house because i had two huge skylights in there Mm -hmm. and so in in a sense it was almost like saying i've okay i've heard this notion of okay green thumb where some people are just seem to be better with plants and Mm -hmm. i was you know, in my scientific mindset saying, okay, I'm going to immediately dismiss that notion that doesn't exist. So therefore Mm -hmm. what environmental factor in my environment is making my plants do so well? Cause all I'm doing is watering. I'm just remembering to water. That's all I do Mm -hmm. and fertilize, but the plants did so well. And yet other people who seem to have the same plants, they didn't like their plants didn't do so well. So -hmm. there has to be something in the environment that was drastically different. And yet Maybe we weren't talking about it so much, Mm -hmm. a.k.a. that is light. We were not talking about the light levels that a plant receives uh, to the to the degree of precision that I think plants, if they could talk, would talk Mm -hmm. about a lot. But we don't talk (laughs) about because humans were just talking about 
what we do, which is like mm -hmm, watering mm -hmm. is an action we do. Fertilizing is an action we do. Giving mm -hmm. light to a plant is not an action we do. We just put the plant there and hope for the best. Yes. Right? So when I first, in fact, I brought it over here. I first went and, you know, to my local shop and got, okay, well, this, what, what meter here measures light? Because I, I, I have a, you know, the electric meter that measures like voltage and stuff like that. And okay, mm -hmm. well, then this looks pretty familiar to me. This is light meter. I, I, I took this around and just walked around my house and realized that, that light levels vary like crazy amounts. And I'm not even talking about sun shining. I'm just talking about whether you're two feet from a window or mm -hmm. three feet from the window, like that tiny mm -hmm. difference makes a difference. And mm -hmm. so, you know, moving forward a little bit with Instagram, you start getting lots of DMs, people <laughs> being like, oh, what's wrong with my plant, right? Exactly, um, yeah. And my first question is always, can you show me where you put the plant? Where you, where, where does the plant live? Where, where is it, exactly, where is it relative <laughs> to your windows? And also, how big are your windows? Because mm -hmm. the, the thing is, every, like, I guess I was skipping ahead a lot, but like every different sized window will let in a different amount of light that you can only measure with a light meter because your eyes yep. will just be like, okay, it's a big window. So what? Right? It's light. Yeah. <laughs> but so yep. anyway, it's just that once I started measuring and also now seeing other people's plants who quote unquote didn't do well. And then I correlated that with where they had it next to the window or <laughs> far from the window, then, <laughs> then. I slowly began to realize that this notion of the so-called green thumb, like who, so the th people who you think have green thumb, meaning that their plants always do well, those are simply the people who have very large and unobstructed windows mm -hmm. or they use grow lights. And, yep. and it is simply because like, if I just boil out down this whole like notion of how a plant grows, it's that light is what lays down the foundation of how well they're going to grow. Mm -hmm. And then your watering, fertilizing, repotting, pruning, and all these things, all of these things are actions that realize that potential. Potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So that is to say, in the opposite sense, if you put a plant far from the window, and I'm, I realize the, the irony that I have a snake plant back here. <laughs> but let, let, let's in, a, in a very dark spot. <laughs> in a very dark spot, yes. Uh, well, I'll talk about that this this part later too. But anyway, let's say I put a plant far from the window, and no matter how good you think you are watering, or you use some special fertilizers, or any, and like you you repot it into like the best possible soil, if it is far from the window, it will not grow. It doesn't matter what else you do, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that's one part of it. Now, the the second part, which I was going to mention about why this plant is back here, is the expectations part, like your mm. own expectations. That yeah. is, I am knowingly putting this plant back here, not expecting it to grow. In fact, I actually don't even care if it dies. It's not dying. It had, I've had it here for two years now. Mm -hmm. But the point is, because my expectations are aligned with what I think about this plant, then I'm not going to be surprised by anything that happens to it. The kind of core of dissatisfaction with plants is <laughs> people expect them to be perfect all the time. Yeah. Yet they are putting them far from windows or they don't have big enough windows to support the growth, the kind of growth that they want. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's like those two mismatched expectations and environmental conditions is like at the heart of why everybody says they kill plants. Not everybody, they but you know plants. what I mean? Like that's oh. why this notion of I kill plants is so prevalent. It's because of this like discrepancy sure i completely understand everything you're saying and more importantly more so is because i have this oh thank I you thank this. you <laughs> i have been binge reading if there's such a thing for those of you who don't know daryl has a book it's one of the most famous books on plants. So if you haven't read it, I highly recommend reading it. It's called The New Plant Parent. But it's not just for new plant parents. It's for everyone. Everyone can, you know, get a lot from this. So as I was reading this book, the first thing I want to say, Daryl, is when I was reading this book, I thought to myself, hmm, if I wrote a plant book, I would like it to be like this. <laughs> It is. It is. I love you. it's. It's awesome. I love the pictures. I love the artwork. I love how it's. It's so conversational, 
actually. It feels like I'm having a conversation with you when I'm reading your book. Mm-hmm. And in, in the book, the, like the first few bits, I mean, I have to confess, I haven't finished reading it, to be honest. But, <laughs> but I did get through quite a lot of it to actually I understood what your philosophy is around what plant care is. And mm. the thing that really touched me the most is what you just explained, the expectation. Mm-hmm. The expectation that most of us have for our plants are, is com- most of the time is actually completely warped. And I think um, I was looking at your Instagram today and you have a reel there where you've got, a, I think it's a Dyphenbacha or I don't know what plant, and it's it's got yellow leaves. Mm-hmm. And you talk about how the yellow leaves actually, I mean, hey, those leaves will die. They will just, ugh. and then you've got just a little plant with a little stalk at the bottom and then the, the leaves are at the top and that's okay. But most mm-hmm. people would look at that and think there's something wrong with my plant. I need yes. to do something about that. It's like a, a necessary shift in the mentality we have for houseplants. I mean, I'm talking about houseplants in particular because again, with outdoor gardening, like Okay, I don't really know how the Melbourne outdoor gardening seasons work, but in 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 Canada, in Toronto, we have like really cold winters. So literally everything is dead, like Guys. dormant, right? It, like yeah. literally no leaves unless it's evergreen. Uh, and even evergreens don't actually push out new needles until the springtime, right? Mm. And same with everything in the ground, like everything that you see on the surface is, is dead by, by November. Right. Mm. And as a good gardener, you're supposed to like, you know, cut it off or, you know, just get rid of the dead material. Um, and then following spring, it, it grows back again because the roots are kind of in the ground and, and safe. Right. Mm. So that idea of turnover is completely fine in outdoor gardening. Nobody panics in the autumn when all the leaves turn yellow, right. And red. And in fact, we say it's beautiful, right. We like it. It looks nice. Right. (laughs) But when it comes to our houseplants, now they're from the tropical regions where they don't necessarily have a full turnover dieback, right? Yeah. However, they do, like each individual leaf still does have a limited lifespan. And mm. therefore, th- then therefore your mentality of how, okay, then therefore when I think about how am I going to enjoy this plant in the long term? Mm. Well, then the idea is once it, like it keeps growing new leaves, uh, provided your conditions like environmental conditions and growing uh, care is good. I keep mm-hmm. growing new leaves and then the older ones simply die off. And then mm-hmm. at some point, like you mentioned, like even I can see your Monstera back there at yeah. some point, you know, your Monstera holds on to, I would say maybe six to eight active leaves on any single vine. And mm-hmm. by the time those active leaves occupy like a very high point of the plant and you just have a, like a long stock of, of leafless exactly, nodes. Exactly, with nothing. And, and it's time it's time to propagate it, right? And it's like, that is a thing that we have to sort of realize that this is just a normal part of the cycle of owning such and such plant. Every okay. plant kind of has a different way of, of turnover. And some plants look good, even at the point where it's time to turn them over. And hmm. other plants maybe don't like they they look a bit uglier let's say like a different bakia like I, my mom's different yeah. bakia when i first got it it was a tiny stump with just tiny little sprouts at that point you could say it didn't didn't look so nice but then <laughs> it grew quite nicely full and bushy right and yeah. then for the next maybe two years it was a perfect you know what you would consider perfect statement plant yes. and mm-hmm. now three to four years in that that bushiness is now way up top and there's a long stem that's actually flopped over that I have to kind of lean against the wall. But, but now, so now I look at it and it's, I don't, I'm not disappointed in the plant. Like that's exactly how the plant is supposed to grow. So now mm-hmm. I say, okay, well, I told my mom, okay, just give me some time to air layer it. Like I'm going to cut some, yeah. like the, the air layer near the top of the, near the top of the stem. And then mm-hmm. once it roots, I'm going to cut, just sever the whole cut thing and then plant it back down. Right. And yep. That is the cycle of owning this Diffenbachia in the long term. And same with the Monstera, mm-hmm. same with any plant that you mm-hmm. think about. You, you, I think about them in terms of what is its long-term strategy, you know? Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. That, is, that is beautiful. It is just absolutely beautiful. That managing of expectations, I think, just is is the business. Now, before mm-hmm. we get into light, we are going to get into light. Like, 
majorly get into light. If you don't know anything about light, this is the podcast for you because <laughs> we're all here to learn. Tell us about your day. What does your day look like taking care of your plants? I live in a little bungalow. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a much bigger space than when I used to live in an apartment downtown. Mm -hmm. and, and yet I haven't increased the number of plants I have. You should own the number of plants that your, win that your windows can support. Can support. So mm. If you if you have, I have one big, huge living room picture window. All my plants are literally like spectators sitting in front of that window, <laughs> and and that's it. There, are, there's no other plant. I mean, other than this guy, but like, there's yeah. no other plants anywhere else except if I have like a grow light or IKEA cabinet. Which, but yes, I have an IKEA cabinet as well. So, mm -hmm. in terms of how I care for them, I mean. Um, well, I'm sure we'll later talk about my philosophy of watering and fertilizing and all that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, I go around to the different areas where I have plants and I just kind of look at them. And sometimes I literally will say like, who needs water today? You know, <laughs> like I just look at the, the soil, the soil <laughs> dryness and just observe it. And then lifting pots, you know, the weight of the pot tells me a lot about how much uh, moisture content is in there. Mm -hmm. um, I have... I, I see how you have many moss poles back there. I have one yeah. moss pole plant, which is wow. a monstera, awesome. monstera obliqua. Beautiful, oh, yeah. like, you know, those really fenestrated leaves. Now I'm kind of um, going against what I said in my book, which was misting is kind of useless. Uh, <laughs> now, because that, because misting, you actually, you know, f deliver the water onto a surface. I can't mm -hmm. pour water onto the, the moss pole, right? So yeah. I, I, I go around and, for example, for that Monstera obliqua, I will spray the the nodes that are against the, the pole. The, the pole. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then other than that, like I'll gather up whatever plants need the water that day. I like to take them to the sink and give them a nice mm -hmm. thorough soaking. And let them yeah. drain away and then, and then put them back into uh, their growing positions. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes if it's a bigger plant, like if it's like a, I have this one uh, Tenanthi burl marxii. So it's mm -hmm. like kind of Calathea style leaves. Yeah. It, it's huge. It's in a, it's in a eight inch pot, but the plant itself overflows like crazy everywhere. Mm. So for that guy, if I have to give him a soaking, then all of its leaves will be wet and it's hard to put it back in the, sp in the place. So I'll take it to the shower, give it a good showering and mm -hmm. just leave it there until the next let day. It dry. When, when, yeah. Let it dry off. Yeah. Mm. So, mm. That's the watering part of the day. Um, and uh, then I'll also like kind of go around and <laughs> although as I'm explaining this in such an idealistic way, I, I actually <laughs> wish it was, I actually wish it was this regimented because sometimes it just feels like it's, I'm just running around like a headless chicken, like find, trying to find. Constantly watering. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, you know, cleaning up leaves, uh, cutting off the dead stuff, you know, as I say, because I'm not worried about the, the leaf Do you know? I think that the concept, that the issue of cutting off the dead stuff and picking up dead leaves is something that's hardly ever discussed. There mm -hmm, are a mm -hmm. lot of, oh gosh, you constantly, every time I go around my plants, I'm just constantly plucking off dead things and dead leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and so the thing is, you know, okay, perfect example, which I talk about in the book, which is a Boston fern, mm -hmm. right? This is your typical mm. fern that people sometimes hang in their, their porches and whatever, right? And yeah. when, when people keep these plants indoors, they they always claim that, oh, it needs really high humidity because otherwise you're going to get dry, brown, crispy leaves and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And I'm saying, no, no amount of humidity is going to prevent some browning of, of leaves. Of the leaves. And, and the thing is, because outdoors, when it's hanging in, in, in the, like in your porch, you don't know that when the wind comes and blows a ball, blows off. Leaves, all the leaves are gone and they fall to the ground. You don't even care. Whereas in your <laughs> house, you do care because you see it on the ground. So it's very, it's much more <laughs> like noticeable. But what I'm saying is that's going to happen regardless of what you do mm. in terms of humidity. And mm. that instead, excellent light just keeps making new fronds come up so mm -hmm. that as the older ones die, new ones have replaced them so that your overall mm -hmm. plant still has that. It nice still looks yeah, bushy look. Yeah, it still so looks good. The same philosophy goes with like like a peace lily. I ha like my peace lily is my probably one of the oldest plants I've had since like about 2014. And mm. when it started, it was like you know from IKEA, small six inch pot. 
And yeah. now it's in a 12 inch pot, like overflowing with, with oh, these wow. lovely dark brown, uh, dark, uh, dark green. Green. Leaves. But, <laughs> but the reason brown, why I want to green. talk about brown, the, the reason why I want to talk about brown is because if you kind of like lift the leaves underneath, there's all these, you know, debris and brown stuff that, you know, I haven't cut off yet. And sometimes I leave it there on purpose just to see, like, if I just don't touch the bottom, like what will happen. Right. And yeah. There's tons of brown like leaves towards the bottom of the plant and that people look at these and they they think, oh, something must be wrong because of some form of decay. But mm -hmm. in reality, the plant has to turn over these leaves because it's growing new ones because the new ones have better, you know, photosynthesis machinery, whatever, you know, yep. stuff just gets old, right? The same as like yep. we shed skin, but we never, we never think about how much skin cells are all over the place, right? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> leaves, unfortunately, are much bigger. So you see those and, and then we get worried about it. But what I'm saying is we need to apply a bit of that logic also to plants and saying that mm -hmm. some degree of leaf turnover has to be has to be natural and mm -hmm. therefore so I, I think i had a, i had a quote one time where i said you know the experienced plant parent is not the one who never loses a leaf but mm -hmm. is the one who knows how much leaf loss is still normal yes that says it all because it's not possible for the leaves to stay there forever mm -hmm. mm. okay all righty <sighs> this is an interesting one ready for this one yeah What's the most, actually, maybe I shouldn't ask you this one because I know what you, I think I know what your answer is going to be. Okay. I know where you're going to take me. What's the most important lesson you've learned during your plant care journey, plant care career? Like one thing. Uh, it, well, yes, it is about light and it is <laughs> Yeah. Light light levels vary so much. Mm -hmm. There's a high degree of variance with light levels. Yeah. And yet human sensitivity to all those levels is it's just way too low. And that is at the core a lot of the confusion around around light in particular. Around right? light, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's and and then Let's layer on top of that, when people discuss, like you and I discuss our care, we f we're like human focus. So we focus on the things that mm. we do. We're doing. We're doing, right? And so in a sense, without measuring light, it becomes something that's kind of just vague in the air. Very, very. Very, very. <laughs> so, Bright, so then, indirect light. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we'll talk about that later, but like when we when we sort of just give a catch all phrase for light, then it comes into our mind. Like, I mean, as a, as a listener, you hear it as, okay, it's just like saying in a recipe, like a pinch of salt, it means I can use it or not if I don't. Exactly. However, if the recipe said exactly 2.5 grams of shaved Himalayan pink rock salt, <laughs> once you read that instruction, then you, you, it goes into your mind as, oh, this must be important because they were so yeah. like they were so specific about saying 2.5 grams, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think there are many different things in plant care that would benefit from speaking or writing about it in a more precise way so that mm -hmm. it enters into the reader's mind as this is mm -hmm. important versus mm -hmm. other things which are not important. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. I actually recently, I liked the, the interview you did with, uh, chocolate botanist and like, de de like debunking myths. And yeah. I think the reason why a lot of these things happen is because, you know, telling somebody, oh, you should use cinnamon to whatever, whatever with your plants. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it may have some benefit, but it's like, because it's such an easy thing to share and easy thing to say, and also easy thing to comprehend, mm. then it becomes, it, it automatically goes high into person's mind as important whereas when i tell people you know measure your light because you know the overall daily light integral for the plant closer to the window blah 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 it, like it just doesn't it doesn't land foot, foot right? candles blah 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 yeah yeah like it doesn't it doesn't blah, land blah, blah, blah. So, so that's why <laughs> before i developed my own light meter i i would just tell like it, it like you know sometimes when i'm talking to somebody and they want their plant advice 
I can tell if they're open to really understanding versus they just want the easy instruction. Like some people just want the easy instruction. And my instruction, mm -hmm. my easy instruction for light is it has to go right in front of your biggest window and don't expect it to grow as good as a greenhouse. That's it. <laughs> I like that. Short and sweet, easily executable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is true. That is okay. So light, light. Yeah. Why is light so important? So it, like, let, let's talk about analogy or yeah, analogy here. Humans, we, we have to, we have to consume food every day in mm -hmm. order to just live and we go about <laughs> our activities. Right. Uh, but, but every day you don't eat the same amount. And sometimes, you know, maybe if you like skip breakfast or you're just working so hard, you skip lunch, you know, you feel it at the end of the day. Like you feel it yeah. in your, your hunger and it's like, you're, I don't know, extra hungry. Maybe you're even hangry. <laughs> so <laughs> now, now imagine if you went a few days, like, let's say, you know, sometimes I've had like weeks at work where we're doing like a deployment or something. And, and like for a few days in a row, maybe I would like not eat a very good lunch or even skip it altogether. And mm. at the end of the week, you know, you, you start to feel really bad. You, maybe you've even lost some weight. You step on the scale mm. and you realize you lost some weight. Now imagine if somebody had to do this for several months or even a year, like mm. then you would literally see, like, you know, you'd, you'd go to your home, to your mom and they, mm. they, your mom, my mom would be like, Oh, you're there. Your face looks skinnier. Like what happened to you? Right. So <laughs> this is, all to say that we understand this perfectly when it comes to humans, because as a human, I understand like this natural uh, fundamental need, right, to survive. Mm -hmm. Well, for plants, when we think about light, the, the plant is like sitting here absorbing photons. Like wh what is it doing? Well, inside those photons are then churning a little motor that makes little sugars for it to, to mm -hmm. eat, like literally eat and mm -hmm. its cells need to, you know, have mm -hmm. carbohydrates to burn energy and all that kind of stuff. So we need to look at light as it is literally allowing this plant to produce food. So mm -hmm. back to my engineering, I, I look at it like it's a little solar powered sugar factory, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, so that's the, like why it's important. But then when we come to talking about plant care, if we always just bright indirect light or blah, 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 like we or low light, medium, low, if we're so wishy-washy about the way we describe light for plants indoors, mm -hmm. then it seems to be a license to just put a plant anywhere you want. Anywhere. And, and then we also layer on top of this that, oh, people buy houseplants because it's a nice decor. It looks nice, right? And, and again, <laughs> it's another reason to put a plant anywhere you want anywhere you, you put it where you think it looks good right where, what do you think i'll stop you there for a second yes. <laughs> what do you think about i always read these like when i'm on facebook or just on these plant pages or whatever someone says hey can someone please let me know what low light plant can i put in my toilet <laughs> I, i'm just like no. i always say fake plant fake put a fake plant oh no they do not want a fake plant they want a real one and they preferably want a zz plant or something mm. like that and it's just it just it just kills me so i've recently come up with an answer that i think is both satisfactory to that person as well as to plant shops and mm -hmm. that is to say and and also it's also good for the plants which is to say you should buy three plants you should buy a zz plant a snake plant and a pothos, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. One of one plant you put in the bathroom and the other two put them in front of your window. Yeah. Then every month <laughs> rotate, rotate rotate them. Right? Basically I'm saying rotate the torture so it doesn't it doesn't kill <laughs> what you, you know, like let them you know, I mean it, back to the analogies. It's like how long can you go without, you know, charging your phone? I mean, most yeah. people nowadays once a day, right? Yeah. So in the same way, you got to put the plant to recharge its its energy <laughs> by putting it in front of the window. In front of the so, window. Like that's the thing with, with snake plants, easy plant. Like how do they get this rap of being great in low light or thrives in low light? And I think really what it is is that these plants simply 
die slower and less noticeably than other plants, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So like, yep. you, you look at this easy, or the snake plant behind me and I mean, it, 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 it's not like all keeled over or anything, right? It's just because it's able to tolerate the starvation mm -hmm. better than if I was to put, if I put a fiddle leaf there, it, oh, no. it would drop half its leaves within a month, right? <laughs> so we just sort of assign this, you know, thrives in low light to the plants that seem to tolerate this torture better than other plants. And so that's mm -hmm. why I'm saying, if you really, really want to put a plant far from a window or even in a windowless room, then you should buy three plants and rotate them once a month. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the best advice I've ever heard, actually, if you insist. But yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, so I'm, I'm giving you I'm license not, to buy three yeah. plants. <laughs> I'm, I'm not as accommodating as you. I'm just like, just don't. Just, no, <laughs> no, no. I'm just, mm -mm, do not do that. It's cruel. It's just torture. You said it. It's torture. Well, I, yeah. It, I mean, it's, it's torture in a sense, but then when when you do the rotating, then it doesn't quite, it, it won't, like your plant can recover from that, you know? Mm. But I guess it's going back to what you've said about your expectation, what you're expecting that plant to do. So I guess mm -hmm. if you're putting that ZZ plant or that pothos in your bathroom, you're not expecting it to live its best life and, you know, thrive. It's just going to sit there to look pretty and green for when you're washing your hands. Mm -hmm. And, and I, the, the, one of the things that I also hoped too is that when I started talking more and more about light, that I, I think there was one Instagram post where I talked about this, where I said, you know, maybe when we first start engaging with houseplants, what we think looks nice versus where the plant will actually grow well might be two different things, right? You mm -hmm. might think it looks nice on a shelf, whereas you measure the light over there and it's like less than 50 foot candles. So then it's terrible for growth, right? Yeah. And my hope is that once you start thinking about the plant as, okay, a living thing that needs the light, <laughs> then your idea of where you think a plant looks nice will suddenly, or not suddenly, but gradually become the same place where it'll actually grow well. So mm -hmm, that way mm -hmm. your aesthetic for what you think a plant looks, when you think a plant looks nice is also the place where it grows well. It grows the best. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Perceptive, it's just shift in how we're thinking and how we want to take care of the plants. Exactly. Like so. So basically, what I'm saying is, is, as a kind of opposite example, whenever I look at home decor magazines, if I see a fiddle leaf fig in a corner that has no windows right in front of it, I'm just they like, just, that's a terrible idea. They, also, they literally just put it there for the shoot. Of course, yeah. <laughs> There's no way that thing would have survived over there. And they mm. love, they love fiddle leaf figs. Fiddle leaf figs are just the poster child for house decor. And then of course, um, for most people, the experience is the direct opposite. Yes. It's a gradual uh, or sudden disappointment. Well, it's, it's exactly what happened to me. My, I mean, I, I've always loved plants, right? And we built a house. My husband and I built a house for our family and it was like, oh, fantastic. I'm thinking I wanted to decorate my house. I wanted to look pretty. Of course, I'm going to buy myself a fiddle leaf fig. Duh. I got Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I got one. And yeah, the light killed her. I've redeemed myself. I've now got four fiddle leaf figs just oh. to prove a point. Just to prove a point. It's like, it wasn't me. Well, okay. Probably was me a bit because I obviously didn't put it in the right place. But it was like, okay, I understand what I need to do now. And I'm redeeming myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I also feel like the same in terms of the philosophy of like, like how you, when you buy plants, right? And like, I, I think because I've, bought lots of different plants over the years, I already kind of settled on, okay, which plants grow well for number one, my environment, but also number two, like how much time I'm willing to spend taking care of them. I mean, mm. to be quite honest, I love the idea of a moss pole making a plant grow huge, but I, I don't <laughs> think that I could spend the time to keep the moss pole moist or like the attention that it requires to keep the moss pole moist. I'd rather just, okay, you know, let let it be in a pot where the, the buffer of, of the length of time between watering is, it's gotta be at least a week. So then <laughs> that way, like I prefer like to keep the plants in, in their pots and I'm just going to sort of like forego the experience of seeing huge leaves. Right. Yeah. So in, in that sense, it, you have to look at your indoor space, like, like it's a garden where it's almost mm -hmm. like a kind of natural selection to say, okay, 
if your humidity is not 60 to 80 like all the time well then maybe you can't keep certain plants just out in the open then you maybe got to keep them in a, in a cabinet or something right mm -hmm. but if you're not willing to even have a cabinet then just well, then... don't engage with those plants then and it's completely exactly. fine yeah that's right that's exactly it. it's it's going back to your environment everything mm -hmm. you've said about you know what does the plant need it's really not you thinking oh this looks pretty it'll look great in my space but <laughs> Is this plant going to thrive in my space? Can I provide the conditions that it needs? And if you can't, then probably best to leave it in the plant shop. Yeah, yeah. I will say that um, I, I've uh, finished writing my second book. <gasps> and uh, it's going to come out in spring of 2024. Uh, oh my gosh, really? And is, yeah, and, and you're free to share this as well. Um, it is called the new, the new Plant Collector. Oh. So how's, it's, that diff how's that different from the New Plant Parent? So the, the new, new Plant Parent was covering like a lot of fundamentals for, okay, your first time getting some plants, you know, here's how I approach plant care and here's how, you know, you could too as well in order to derive like maximum enjoyment with, with minimal like kind of effort and being confused with with stuff because you're learning yeah. your fundamentals and then of course i i cover a, a basic set of of typical house plants right yeah uh and then in the new plant collector it goes now further into well like kind of these rare plants that we talk about thai constellation mm -hmm. um, yeah a lot of different philodendrons and then it also goes into like remember how i talked about like how feasible is it for you to keep a you know, a IKEA greenhouse cabinet. Some yeah. one of the people I talked to in the book, uh, he has a a down like a basement grow tent. So the whole section, I guess, of the basement is a grow tent, right? Yeah. And and another person has an outdoor greenhouse. So mm -hmm. it's now talking more about okay, showing you examples of okay, now if you are willing to, here's the kinds of kinds of environments that you could potentially build. Create, or, or develop yeah. for your plants and the number two it focuses more on those kind of rare collectible type plants the, mm -hmm. the idea that um a lot of houseplant books have focused more on decor but this one mm. focuses more on okay if you're starting to develop a collection because you like maybe even a particular genus of plants then mm. You know, here's a few examples and here's how you can go about creating the best possible environment for them. Mm, that is that is very interesting. That is a truly next level. <laughs> yeah. And, I, like and I mean, I, I hope that people see that it is really a, a sort of natural progression, even progression. for myself, my own hobby of, of like how, you know, if you're if you're not just having it for decor and that's the and that's the end all be all. But rather yes. now you're interested in in having more plants and even creating spaces specifically for the plants. Mm, mm, mm. And I think most people, well, at least most people who've been listening to this anyway, I think that's probably where they're heading towards. I mean, the, probably, mm -hmm. you know, they're done with the porphos and they're done with that. And like, oh, that anthurium looks nice. And the minute exactly. you start thinking anthuriums look nice, that's, that's a whole other rabbit hole you don't want to go down. But mm -hmm. if you do decide you want to go down that rabbit hole, there are a few things you need to do. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So it like in the first book, I didn't talk anything about anthuriums. Uh, there's nothing about Talansia. There's not. There was nothing about e Echeveria um, mm. or Haworthia or Haworthiopsis. There, like, yeah. and, and these are the plants that I see that people really like to collect because there's so mm. many different varieties, right? So that was sort of the essence of the second book, which is to to cater to the people who are interested in collecting. And mm. to be and to be sort of perfectly fine with having different types of collections. Like I talk yes. about in the book that I see different genuses of plants. Like people can have a uh, uh, favor towards different types of genuses the same way people like different styles of music. Mm, mm, mm. That's right. What is your take on Hoyas? I don't know if I've ever seen you with a Hoya. Uh, I, well, so uh, yeah, Hoya is in the book as well. Um, I, I have a few... Hoyas, and I do appreciate their kind of interesting, like, I like how they're so hardy and durable, right? Yeah. Um, and of course, the flowers are interesting if you have, if you have good enough light for it. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I guess I just don't, I guess I just don't talk about them as much. But in terms of my favorite, the ones that I have is the Hoya Matilda. 
with the, the mm. small, small green ones. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's, yep. Variegated hair, uh, care AI, which is the heart mm. one. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Another one is, uh, I kind of forgot the name because I bought it recently. Is it uh, not undulata or corda- cordata? The one mm-hmm. with kind of like really almost dead looking leaves. Yes. A, a very like pointy cordata. I think it's the cordata and it looks cordata, a bit gray. Yeah. It's almost it looks gray, bit... yeah. It yes, almost looks that's like real one. Locks. It's just really fascinating, like their their leaf textures and, and of course the flowers. Yes. So yes. yeah, I have, so I have, I do have a few. I don't ha- like, I mean, I know some people who have like, they kind of have like hundreds of different ones, right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, if I happen to see one that's interesting, then I, I'll, I'll like, I'll try it. Um, mm. But they, they generally do very well in my cabinet and, mm. you know, they take really high light. I'm giving them like almost a thousand foot candles for 12 mm-hmm. hours a day. So oh, uh, nice. They must yeah, be very they, happy. Yeah. Yeah, they are. <laughs> mm, have, have you, you you must have had lots of flowers then uh, uh yeah on the matilda it's been flowering quite a lot um yeah. i haven't seen the un or the cordata flower yet the mm. carry i i mean generally is pretty slow um yeah. but uh i i am happy with how it's grown in terms of like it, it's interesting too like i i like you know way back when when i first saw the carry i it was always Oh, Valentine's the Day, here's leaf. a cute little thing. <laughs> and then everyone, the first thing everyone realizes that, oh, it, it won't actually grow anything, right? <laughs> so so that's why when I when I saw a full plant, like, you know, with the vine and everything, several yeah. leaves, I, I bought it right away. And at the time, $30 seemed like a lot for the six-inch pot, right? Yeah. And for maybe the next two years, it literally did nothing. Did except nothing. Grow some like very the vine like, or the vine and also a very balloon shaped kind of weird looking green leaf that wasn't quite as <laughs> like uh variegated as the old ones right now of oh. course the reason is because of light. light and then that's when i realized okay i now that i have ikea cabinet i'll put it in the top shelf light is really close i measure a thousand foot candles and i'm keeping it on you know 12 14 hours a day then it just grew like crazy like new leaves new leaves I made oh, wow. and then I made one time lapse video where I actually saw like that tiny, tiny little like. Oh, I remember thing. that one! I remember yeah, that yeah. one! I oh my gosh! I that's told the, you I love that's your the carry eye. Yeah, yeah, I remember that one. Yes, I do, I do, I do. Oh yeah, but I I love Hoyas. I I'm I'm a sucker for a Hoya. Absolutely. I I don't even know how many I've got at this point. <laughs> where um, where do you keep them? I have a grow room. Oh yes, nice. So I converted one of the bedrooms in the house into a grow room. So it's it's not definitely not ideal conditions. It's just okay. You guys are just gonna park here for a while. And yes, I know I don't have enough light for you. I'm working on it, type thing. But eh, you know, they're happy for <laughs> now. They're not yeah. living their best life, but they're happy enough. I think I've only had two of my Hoyas flower again. The light situation. I need more grow lights. Mm-hmm. Or you could uh, uh, invest in more windows. Well, you you did say in your book that w- since you can't get more windows, get grow lights. That, that's what you said. I, c- I can read it back to you. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, yeah. I was going to say grow lights is the cheaper solution. And, yes. And actually, in terms of grow lights, mm-hmm. in terms of grow lights in 2023, we're mm-hmm. in a time where, number one, the, it's it's super cheap to get white mm-hmm. grow lights, mm-hmm. and number two, that those grow lights are strong enough for all of our foliage houseplants, right? Because a lot of concerns that people used to have about grow lights was because they were trying to grow, uh, like let's call it tomatoes in their basement. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know, you know, what the regulations for talking about, you know, certain types of plants are, but let's just call it if you try Tomatoes. to grow a tomato, if you try to grow a tomato in your basement, you know, you had to have extremely powerful lights. And yep. at the time, the best technology for that were were so-called partial spectrum grow lights. Not they weren't mm-hmm. so good, but I mean, they still did the job, but it, it required <laughs> like, you know, a thousand watt grow light, which is which is crazy in terms of the amount of power it requires. Exactly. But, but now when we're just growing our, you know, these types of plants, we don't need nearly that much, uh, that much light. So mm. having the kind of 
you know, convergence of number one, cheap manufacturing of grow lights, and number two, that these house plants don't need that much light. Now we're living in a time when you, yes, you could grow all of these tropical house plants in a room with no lights. I mean, in a room with no windows, uh, and mm. just maybe three or four grow lights. Yeah, yeah, it is. I have, I don't know how many. I think I've got about six or seven grow lights dotted all over the house, and. Yeah, where I've got a plant that doesn't have a window or whatever, I'll chuck a grow light there. I'll chuck a grow light. I need more, but mm -hmm. I just chuck grow lights everywhere. And like you said, they're, they're relatively cheap now. And you don't even have to get like a, like a grow light with a this. You can just get the bulb and just get any lamp. You can get a lamp that you like that suits with your decor or whatever and just chuck it in there in the grow light. Mm -hmm.